our next concept about working in three space with vectors is going to be the cross product. So uh, as an introduction to the cross product, uh, intuitively the cross product gives us a vector that is perpendicular or normal to the plane that is spanned, which means to be formed or created by any two vectors. So just pause here and let's think about this. If you got two vectors, I got this vector u here, and then I've got this vector v, and let's just say we plotted them at the origin in three space. You know, if you if you scale these vectors up or down, you can kind of add them together and you can get to any point on this plane that it's generated. So any two vectors is enough to kind of generate a plane or span a plane, it's called. So why was why is this useful? Because the cross product gives us a vector that's normal to the plane that's spanned by these two vectors. So why would that be useful? Well, in this similar way that slope tells us about the incline of a line in three space, we know a lot about a line if we just know the slope. Anything else is just a horizontal or vertical, well, with a line, it's just a vertical shift up or down. The normal vector is going to tell us a lot about the incline of the plane in three space. So I've got a picture of a surface here. The, to the left, we see the, sorry, let's do the left first. To the left, we see that, yeah, if you know the slope of a line, you know a lot about that line, whether it's a negative slope, whether it's a positive slope, how steep it is or how gradual it is. Now in three space, the picture I've got isn't actually a plane. It's a, it's a curved kind of surface that has lots of um, change in, in its uh, surface. But if you look at it at any point on that surface, if you, can, if you know the vector that starts at that point and extends normal or uh, to the plane, perpendicularly or orthogonally away from the plane, uh, we call that normal, it tells you about what the, how the plane is, how tilty that plane is in three space there. And I made up a word tilty, but I hope it makes some sense here. And if you just have a singular plane, you know, this plane is just sticking out in three space. If I have a normal vector to that plane, that's going to be perpendicular or orthogonal to that, that plane, I know how tilty, how, what, how that plane is kind of oriented in space. So that's what we can, one of the major uses that we can use for the cross product. But as usual, before we can talk about how to use it, we've got to introduce the actual concept. So the first thing is the definition of the cross product here. And the definition is U cross V is given by the magnitude of U times the magnitude of V um, times sine of V, all that. Well, what is all that? All that stuff in parentheses here, it's going to be a number times a number times a number. That's just a coefficient, a number uh, scaling a normal vector, where n for normal. n is a unit normal vector, so it's a length one unit, which is orthogonal to the plane generated by u and v, following the right-hand rule by first sweeping through u and then v, as we see down here in the lower left-hand corner. u cross v is a normal vector to the plane generated by u cross u and v uh, using the right-hand rule, sweeping through u first and then v. As with the dot product, uh, theta is limited between zero and pi. And an important to note here that the cross product is only a concept in three space, not two spaced. And notation for three space and two space respectively, as we saw before that that double bar R represents the real number line. Well, two space is really just two real number lines being developed and expanded into a grid system. Um, so we've got R2 down here for two space. And then for R3, you've got three um, real number lines, including the z-axis, to get a, a three-dimensional kind of gridded system. But that's kind of beside the point. Okay, so let's talk about the some properties of the cross product. The cross pro the dot product was awesome. You know, it, it kind of behaved like we wanted it to, like we're kind of used to with regular algebras um, being applied to variables and different concepts. Um, but the cross product is not quite as well behaved. Um, it is not commutative. You cannot switch the order. U cross V is equal to negative V cross U, but important to note is that U cross V does not equal V cross U. So order matters here. Um, whoops, sorry about that. Turn the video on accidentally. Um, it's left distributive and also right distributive. Uh, U cross V over addition uh, or subtraction, if you will, of, of uh, vectors as you kind of distribute the cross product over the addition. So u cross v would give you u cross v, and then distributing it over the addition there, you'd get 
u cross w. Um, you could do that from the right, much the same as you know x plus four times three is equal to three x plus 12. We just tend to like to switch the order because you can do that with regular stuff, with regular uh, variables and numbers. Um, but here with the cross product, you could do right distribution, but you would have to keep track of the order that you did it in. And so for instance, just um, if we had, let's make that V plus W, just like it's shown above. And this time we're taking U and distributing it from the right, we would have V cross U, not U cross V, plus W cross U. And there's your right distribution. So again, order matters here. But it is not associative. You can't do U cross V first and then take that with crossed with W. Uh, well, you can do that, but it's not the same as taking U and crossing it with first doing V cross W. And there are lots of uh, more properties and if we need them, we'll kind of present them as they show up, but they're listed out in the text as well. So uh, the magnitude of the cross product, now that we've seen the definition of the, of the cross product, let's look at the magnitude of the cross product. We'll go ahead and whack your magnitude bars around U cross V, and then we'll whack those bars around the definition. And so, well, what's the magnitude of something of length one? Well, it's just one. And so that's why the N disappears in the second line. Um, what's the, well, these are already numbers, so the magnitude of a number isn't going to affect anything. And sine of theta is just a number, and so the magnitude of that is not going to affect anything. So effectively, by whacking the magnitude bars around u cross v in the definition, you're left with just u, the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v times sine of theta. And uh, again, that's because the magnitude of n is equal to 1, and for when you have sine uh, sine of theta is going to be positive greater than zero for the restriction of theta that we have between zero and pi. So one application of the cross product is that we can use it to find the area of a parallelogram and as we'll see that we can extend that to triangles. So let's review on the left here. The area of a parallelogram is given by the base times the height where the height is measured by dropping a vertical straight perpendicularly down to the base from the top. So if we changed the notation here a little bit and we made this uh, this vertical kind of um, side of the parallelogram, if you will, we called that u, and then we said that, and then we called the base v instead of b. The represented the base b by vector v rather would be a better way to say that. And then called the angle between those two vectors theta. Well, then what we're going to have is that sure enough base is equal to the magnitude of V because you know this length here would be the magnitude of V and because trigonometry the height there is going to be given by the magnitude of U times sine of theta. All right so that gives us the area of the parallelogram generated by two vectors. We could also extend this idea and find the area of a triangle uh, generated by two vectors. So again, we have, I'll stick with the conventions we used last time. Sort of looks pretty similar to the, whoops, that should be V. Sort of looks pretty similar to the picture we had last time with angle theta between them. These two generate, these two vectors generate a triangle. And well, since the form, the entire cross product gave you the entire parallelogram, Notice that one half of that area is going to give us the area of the triangle generated by the vectors u and v. Okay, so now that we've seen what we can use the cross product for to generate a normal vector or to find some areas, let's talk about how we calculate the cross product, you know. Okay, so in order to talk about how to calculate the cross product, we first have to talk about uh, determinants. Um, because calculating the cross product involves taking the determinant of a matrix. And so there, I'm going to present two methods to calculate determinants, but first we have to establish some notation. So square brackets around a matrix represent a plane matrix. And in general, we label the, uh, the elements of a matrix in the format uh, of 
A or whatever variable you're going to use, the subscript row column. So A sub 2, 1 is going to be in the second row, first column, and so forth. Now, if we make those bars vertical and leave off the little square bracket part, that represents the determinant of a matrix. That notation is man means take the determinant of this matrix. All right, so now we need a, one more piece of vocabulary. So the matrix minor related to a matrix entry is the resulting smaller matrix with the row and column relating to the matrix entry removed. Now that's a lot of words. So let's go ahead and kind of wrap our heads around what that means. So let's find, let's go ahead and find the minor of the second element of the first row, A sub one, two. Okay, so here is the element that we're interested in. So the matrix minor related to this entry is going to be a smaller matrix with the row and column related to that entry removed. Okay, so if we're gonna remove the first row, we're gonna take out the first row of A and then to remove the related column, we're gonna take out the second column. What are we gonna be left with? We'll highlight that in green to represent we're gonna keep these entries. Well, I'm gonna keep those two entries and then keep those two entries. And so the matrix minor you're gonna get related to entry A12 is gonna be A21, A31, A23, A33. And those are those matrix entries respectively. Okay, so let's see how to actually take these uh, ideas and use them to calculate cross products. So the determinant of a matrix, here's the definition. Uh, so let A be any matrix. I've written a three by three matrix, but if you have a larger and this has to be square, I haven't said that or written it on here. Um, and for the purposes of this class, we're just gonna work with a three by three square matrix all the time, but I'm kind of just giving you a little bit more information. As long as you have a square matrix, this method can be used. So you got your matrix A and we wanna calculate the determinant of A. Sometimes that's notated as determinant uh, A there. And so what we do is we start with the first row, first column, upper left-hand corner entry, and you establish a alternating checkered pattern. So positive, negative, positive, first row, second row, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. And since you're working with a square matrix, this will always work nicely and you'll get a nice alternating pattern here. Ah. All right, expand along the first row. So following the checkered sign patterns, uh, you take the sum, adding or subtracting, of the matrix entry times the determinant of the corresponding minor. So the example I have here is we're going to take the determinant of this matrix A by expanding along the first row. Okay, so let's let's highlight that. We're going to expand. It says to expand along a row. Let me have this highlighter. No, I want the actual tool. Quit. Why can't I grab that one? There we go. All right. I'm gonna expand along the first row. Uh, so I don't want that quite yet. So along the first row, I'll consider the first element, A11. It's gonna be positive because of the checkered pattern. And now the related minor, we would remove these rows and we would be left with just this, which is what you see here. Notice I have the vertical bars around that because we're taking the, the determinant of this related minor matrix. Okay, and so you just keep going. You say, okay, well then for the next uh, term in this expression, I'm gonna take the second element of our first row and we're gonna have it be negative following our checkered pattern times the related minor there, where if we took out this, uh, we would have just left with a this row and this row and you'll notice those two things match. Right, and last but not least, we're to the last element of our first row, A13, and that's gonna be positive again, following our checkered thing. And I'm not gonna write out the, the, the minor there because I'm hoping you can all see it and you can pause the video and think about it for fun. And there you go, you've got an expression now for the determinant. But the problem is you've got a determinant expression for the large three by three matrix A that involves, uh, well, I don't know, three more determinants of smaller matrices. 
The reason this is nice and this works though, is that it's relatively easy to calculate the determinant of a two by two matrix. I've got the word minor in there because all of our two by twos happen to be minor matrices, but this works for any two by two matrix. Um, you take and you multiply the diagonal that way, that's positive. And then you take and subtract that, the diagonal the other way, and it's negative. All right, and this actually kind of matches this definition. I realize that I've, I've said something, it's been a, a minute since I've actually looked at the determinant of a four by four, so don't take everything I said as gospel. However, though everything I've said is absolutely true for three by three matrices and two by two as well. All right, that looks kind of ugly, if only there were a nicer way. Well, so here's the second method I said I was gonna present, and this is, usually the method that uh, people prefer, and this is the method that I'm going to use uh, most likely exclusively in this class. So this is the shortcut method for calculating the determinant of a three by three matrix. matrix. So we've got ourselves a matrix. We've got A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, or whatever it says, not what I said, uh, correct letters. Then we can find the determinant of this matrix, determinant of matrix A by, well, we take the matrix, A, B, C, etc. That matches. We write it down. And then it says we repeat the first row uh, or the first and second columns after the third column of the original matrix. And so I've taken this first row and dropped it down, ADG, repeated it once. And I've taken the second row, B, uh, I keep saying row and what I mean is column, and then the second column, BEH, and repeated it there. And so now I have this uh, three by five matrix, if you will, rows by columns. And what we do is we're going to sum the products of the diagonals using the following pattern. For the first three columns, we're gonna use the forward diagonal and add them as a positive product. And so I'm gonna use green for positive and you know, green positive, and then we're gonna see subtract negative. So you know, red for negative, green forward, red backwards, I don't know, hopefully it's intuitive or a little helpful. Okay, so the first three columns forward diagonal and add those products. So if I do the first, uh, starting at the first columns, I wanna take a forward diagonal. So the forward diagonal starting at A would give me, let's uh, get a green pen like I said I would, A times E times I. And since it's a forward diagonal, it's going to be a positive. And then to that, we're gonna keep going for the first three entries. I see that I've written the word columns here. Um, and I wanna say entries instead. That's better, I think. And then for the second entry, the forward diagonal would be BFG and that would be positive and I'd add that to the first result and then CDH. So I'd add those. Now that I've done those first three, it's time to do the next three. We're gonna reuse, notice the very last bullet point here. Yep, we reuse the middle column twice in uh, two different diagonal calculations. So now for this, for the last three entries of the first row, we're gonna do a backwards diagonal, if you will, a diagonal that descends to the left. So the first one would start at C and I would take C times E times G. And since it's a backwards diagonal, we would have ourselves a negative product there. And then the next one would be A, F, H, and then we'd subtract that guy. And then we'd subtract the result of B, D, and I. And you can write that all out and it, it results in some horrible, horrible, um, horrible definition. And, and, and if you look at your textbook, you'll, you may see that the formula for the cross product actually is this horrible, horrible thing involving entries of a matrix being added and subtracted all in front of the X, Y, and Z components of a vector. And really it is just this product of taking the determinant of three by three matrix, which is what we're going to illustrate now. I got ahead of myself there. I thought this next slide was the next an example slide. And it's coming soon to a class near you, I promise. But this slide is just what I said written out. So you can use this process of taking the determinant of a three by three matrix to calculate the cross product. In fact, the cross product is the determinant of the three by three matrix generated in this manner. The first row is always 
i, j, and k are standard unit vectors in three dimensions. The second row is u, the vector u. Uh, and again, first component, second component, third component, x, y, z, if you will. And then the third row is always v, u cross v. So the first thing you're being crossed is the middle row. The last thing, uh, let me say that again. The first vector that's in the cross product is going to be the middle row, and the last vector in the cross product is going to be the last row there. So now, if you wanted to, you could do the process I just described of, of writing out and repeating these rows and then doing those forward additions and then backwards subtractions. And you would arrive at the definition, that ugly definition I was just talking about of the cross product. Uh, but I think it's easier just to remember as the determinant of this three by three matrix generated like that. So now, now let's do an example. And so to find u cross v, we're gonna write out the matrix. So u cross v, those are both vectors. So they'll get noted, notated as vectors. Um, Well, here's the, here's the formal writing it out. It would be the determinant of i, j, and k as our standard unit, unit vectors. And then the middle row is going to be our first vector in the cross product, u. So it's going to be the x component of u, the y component of u, and the y component of uh, the z component of u, noting that it's 1j and 1k respectively. And the last row here is going to be vector v. And so we're going to have a negative 4 for the x component, 3 for the y component, and 1 for the z component because it's 1k. OK, so now I'm going to rewrite this thing because I'm going to need to repeat those uh, first and second rows at the end of it. And it's not really a matrix. This is just how we calculate that determinant. So now this is all scratch work here. So i, j, k, um, 2, 1, 1 negative four, three, one. Give this a quick save. Repeat the first row, i, two, negative four. Repeat the second row, uh, a column, sorry. Repeat the first column, repeat the second column, j, one, three. And sure enough, that gives us a setup. Now I'll stick with my green forward for positives and red backwards for negatives with respect to the diagonals. We're going to expand along this first row. Um, I times one times one gives us down here, we're going to have one times one times I. So I'll just keep writing in green. One times one times I hat. Now for J, we're going to get J times one times negative four. So I'm going to add that to one times negative four times J hat. Plus last positive one, K times two times three gives us two times three times k. Now with all this plusing and minusing, you're, you might be looking at this and thinking, why is he bothering by putting everything in parentheses? Well, by putting all the multiplications in parentheses, I'm less prone to make a mistake with respect to my signs uh, when I'm doing the additions and subtractions and figuring this all out. So I encourage you to do the same if it's helpful. Now, starting with that middle column, k, we're, gonna, we're moving into our negatives. So uh, it's going to be negative one times, or I'm sorry, one times negative four. And as doing this process, just go slow and be careful. So for our second subtraction, it's going to be one times three times j hat. And then our next one, it's going to be our final subtraction. Oh, here you go. I always make this mistake and I'm glad I did it. Uh, and you guys were watching me do it um, because no, it's not j hat, that's i. Be careful there. I don't know, maybe you'll make a different mistake, but that's a common one that I do. Okay, so now our final subtraction involves j, and it's going to be 1 times 2 times j. Again, so I think that's a good time to revisit what I just said. Just go slowly and be careful. All right, so what do we have? We have 1 i hat, and then we have minus 4 j hat, and then we have plus 6 k hat. And then what do we have after that? We have negative one times negative four. We have positive four k hat, and then minus three i hat, and then minus two 
j hat. Now, combining like terms, we will get, hey, now this result is we're finally done, u cross v, we're, we're done with kind of, this was all just scratch work here, but this finally, our result, once we combine these like terms, will be our actual cross product. So combining one i with negative three i, we get negative two i hat. And now combining negative four j and negative two j, we get negative six j hat and positive six k and positive four k gives us positive 10 k hat. And we've done it. Um, that was some work, so we'll celebrate with a highlight. Okay, so we've got this, we calculated u cross v. Looks like I have two slides in here just in case I didn't have enough room to do it once. Right, now that we've seen how to calculate a cross product, let's move on to applications here. Um, and the first thing we're going to talk about is the what we've mentioned at the very beginning and haven't talked looked back at, but you can use the cross product to generate a orthogonal vector, a vector that's normal to the plane spanned or generated by any two vectors. Um, so let's let's do that. Find a unit normal vector to the plane containing the points p one negative one zero q two one negative one and r negative one one two. Well, if I decided that, I was going to think about, hey, let's start at point P and go to Q and go to R, keeping in mind that this is probably not accurate to scale here. Um, the first vector we'll call PQ will be U and PR will be V. And so PQ is 1, 2, negative 1. PR is negative 2, 2, 2. And now it is time to calculate U cross v. So let's see. Yeah, let's just do this this way. You know what? I'm going to change this equals to a shorthand here uh, because I'm not going to write out exactly what the cross product is. Rather, I'm going to do the scratch work version of generating the matrix and then doing the math from there. We got i hat, j hat, and k hat. We're going to repeat those, but we'll get the first three, the three by three matrix down first. So first u, because it's u cross v, and we're going to get one, two, negative one. Let's make that two a little better. One, two, negative one. Now for v, the third row, negative two, two, and two. Now it's time to repeat our first column, i hat, followed by our second column, j hat. So the first column is i hat, one, negative two, the third, last, the the repeat of the second column, the last column in this three by five rig is j hat two, two. Stick to the colors because they're treating us well. All right, so for the first thing, I'm going to get two times two is going to give me four i hat. And then for the next one, negative one times negative two gives me positive two, positive two, j hat. And then for my last addition here, I'm gonna have two times one is two, k hat. Now move on to the subtraction, starting with that middle column. So I'm gonna put a subtraction here and then I'm gonna say negative two times two is negative four. So I'm gonna subtract negative four. And again, I'm kind of leaving a little bit out because I don't have as much room as I would love here, but go slow, be careful because you don't wanna to have to, to do this calculation twice because of dropping a sign somewhere. Our second, okay. So get my subtraction down. Now can figure out what we're subtracting by. Negative one times two is negative two times, careful, that's i hat, not j hat. I don't know why, I just think it like is j k or j i. I always make that mistake, so just be careful. Uh, hopefully that saves somebody a little bit of trouble. And now for our last subtraction, we've got j is gonna be one times two. We're gonna subtract two j's. Okay, when you do that, you can combine like terms, and what you're going to get is that u cross v is equal to 4i, um, and then minus a negative 2i is positive 6i, and then 2j, and then minus 2j, that adds to zero, so that guy's gone, 
And then now for k's, I have two k's and then I have a positive 4k. I'm going to have plus 6k hat. Uh, it turns out now we have this vector will be normal to what I'm going to, this isn't formal notation. In fact, I've never seen it there, but I'm going to call it the uv plane representing the plane generated by the vectors u and v. Okay, so we've got ourselves a normal vector, but I hope that if you think about it in three space, that a vector that's length six in the i direction and length six in the k direction, um, it's probably going to be longer than one. It's not yet normal or not yet unit length. And what we want is we want a unit normal vector. So we have to scale this thing down by its length. Now we've done length calculations before, but we'll go ahead and kind of put this in here, make a little room. So u cross v, the magnitude as double bars is equal to the square root of the component squared. So we're going to have six squared plus zero squared for that y component plus six squared. That's going to give us twice times 36 in there. So that's six root two. All right, so there's our, um, our uh, magnitude of our vector, which if we then scale it down, um, yeah, let's, let's look at the notation on this particular line. What we have is we have a number being multiplied by a vector, but I just put the vector in parentheses to kind of emphasize that u cross v is a vector. Uh, we're applying the scaling to the whole thing. And so for the i component, we would have 6i uh, times 1 over 6 root 2 would be 6 root 2 i hat, plus similarly we'd have 6 over 6 root 2 k hat. Simplifying that out, we get uh, 1 over root 2, or root 2 over 2, if you like, plus 1 over root 2 k. In general, I won't make you rationalize any denominators and get roots out of denominators, but I do kind of expect you to simplify roots as we are doing these. Okay, so let's take a look at this example and a graph. Okay, I got all kinds of stuff going on here. I need this to go away. Get out of there. That's what I want. There we go. There we go, got it. Apologies, sometimes it's hard to run this thing with the little marker. Load this little applet here. Uh, and I know it's small, but you can go ahead and click the link uh, on the slides if you like to explore this in, in person. Um, and you can see that, hey, U and V there, those two vectors we have, generate this kind of blue, te light tealish plane. And I've labeled it relatively poorly and, and hard to read light blue as the plane generated by U U and V. And if you get it at an angle, you can see that sure enough, U and V generate this little plane here. All right, so now what? Well, that great big pink vector is, uh, if you look off to the left, it's 606. That's GeoGebra's notation for a vector is those, um, you could think of it as a single column matrix. Also another notation for vectors that we're not going to use this much in this class, but it is. So that's a nice long vector. But the important thing is you can see that it is nice and perpendicular to our plane, or at least it looks like it. And then notice there at the near the origin, the scaled down version, the last entry to the column on the left of our inputs is the normal vector, this, the unit normal vector version of u cross v which is one over root two comma zero comma one over root two. All right. Kind of nice after doing all that math to see that we did in fact get the right answer. Okay, so that's how we can use uh, the cross product to generate a normal vector to a plane. And if you need it to be a unit, you just scale it down to unit length. The next thing we can, or another thing we can use the cross product for is to find something called the box product or the triple scalar product. And this is u cross v. You got to do that first. That's what we set the uh, set of parentheses around those. That gives you a vector though. So keep in mind that this entire expression is a vector. And so it makes sense to take the vector dotted with w because you can dot product two vectors. And it turns out that instead of doing the calculation of getting the cross product first and having to do a uh, determinant of a three by three matrix and then take the dot product of that result with another vector, 
you can calculate this uh, box product by just doing the determinant of this matrix where u, v, and w are all the v and w and u scripts, as you see. The first row is given by vector u, the second row is given by vector v, and the third row is given by vector w. This calculation, when you take the determinant of that three by three matrix and calculate the box product, um, you will get a number. That number could be a negative number though. Um, so if you take the absolute value of the box product, hence the single vertical bars around this whole calculation, we get um, a number that gives us the volume of the parallelopiped, which is formed by vectors u, v, and w. And so the last note here is note that the outer vertical bars on the matrix represent the absolute value of the result of the determinant bars. Because we're using double bars around a vector to represent magnitude, but here they have a different meaning. First bar is the uh, determinant of the matrix, and the outer ones are the absolute value of that determinant, because that determinant could be a negative value. So let's do ourselves a box product calculation. So find the volume of the parallelopiped formed by the vectors. Um, u is equal to negative 1, negative 2, 1. v is equal to 4, 3, 2. And w is equal to negative 5, uh, 0. I'm sorry. For, uh, w is equal to 0, negative 5, negative 2. It could have just read it with the variables instead of in component notation. But. OK, let's do a box product calculation. So to figure out the box product, I'm going to set up my matrix. And I'm going to do uh, for the u row, the first one. Let's go ahead and do it this way. Uh, negative 1, negative 2. Ah, no, we're going to use blue and or red and green for uh, positive and negatives, as we have been. So negative 1, negative 2, 1. There's our u row. The second row is going to be 4, 3, 2 from v. The third row is going to be w. Now w doesn't have a x component, so we have to add a 0 there. 0i zero minus 5j gives us minus 5, minus 5, 2k minus 2k gives us minus 2. So now we've got our three by three matrix and we need to take the determinant of this matrix. Instead of writing out the notation as we saw on the last slide, I'm gonna use this to just continue on and use the shortcut method for calculating a determinant of the three by three matrix. So we'll repeat the first column, negative one, four, zero, and now repeat the second column, negative two, three, negative five. As usual, forward, first three entries of the first row, forward diagonals, we'll add them. So we will get two and one, both negative, give us two times threes, gives us six. Um, plus, we're doing additions because we're going forward multiplications. Oh, zero times anything is zero. Be careful. Don't think that that's negative four. That's a common mistake here. And then the last positive addition is going to be uh, one doesn't matter because anything times one is just itself. So negative four times uh, negative five times four is negative 20. So I'm going to be adding a negative 20. Now for the subtraction diagonals, starting again with our middle column, uh, one times three times zero. Never mind. It's a common mistake here for students to do one times three is three and then be like, oh yeah, zero. Okay, it doesn't matter. So that's three. Nope, remember, anything times zero is zero. The next subtraction is going to be, well, negative five and negative one give me positive five times two is 10, so it's going to be positive 10, so I'm going to be subtracting a positive 10. And then here we've got negative 2 for our final subtraction. We've got negative 2 times negative 2 is positive 4 times 4 is 16, so minus 16. So what we have here is a bunch of numbers. I have negative 20, and negative 10 is negative 30, and negative 16 is negative 46 plus my green six gives me pa negative 40. Now it doesn't make much sense to have um, a negative volume, but that's why we have these 
absolute values around the result of the determinant. What I just did on that last, on the next slide is this, I've just calculated the determinant of that matrix and it's a negative 40, but to do the absolute value of that, we will take the absolute value and we will say, okay, so this is what we are after. The volume of our parallel pipe bed is equal to the absolute value of 40. So volume is equal to 40 units cubed. And that's it for the box, uh, not box product. Well, that is it for the box product, but that's it for our discussion about the cross product.